Do you want to know 1,000 ways to make $1,000? In this book, you will learn stories from different people who succeeded in business and lived a happier life. Some of them are previously unemployed. Some of them started very young. These entrepreneurs faced many challenges, but they didn't give up. 1,000 Ways to Make $1,000 was originally published in the 1930s. This is a classic, but all its principles still holds true today. The famous billionaire investor, Warren Buffett, had this book to thank for inspiring him at an early age. 1,000 Ways was made available again for the new generation. How to Start Your Own Business there is no better time to start your own business than now. If you have that product or service which you know you can sell, you can start doing so right now at this moment. Do not wait for things to happen. Do not wait for your situation to get better. Do not listen to what the people say around you. If you think about the obstacles you will face, then it will cripple you. Just start moving. You need to have that determination. You need to have that drive. People call it guts. If you have guts to succeed, you won't be discouraged. That is even if you fail at first. Your goal is to succeed, to make money, and to live a better life. In order to get there, you must start the journey. Maybe you're thinking that you don't have a capital, but even that can be arranged. The most important thing is you have that will to make money. Start your own business and start it now. You can learn from the story of Gustavus Swift. He was a young man with difficulty in walking. He lived in small village. Swift did not have capital, but he got a lot of guts in him. The other young men in his village think of ways to make money. Swift did not waste time and started working. He knows how to dress meat. He prepared one good calf and dressed it the best way he can. Swift walked for miles to sell his quality meat. He did not mind all the work. Swift thought of it as an adventure. Later on, he came to Chicago and started the Swift meatpacking business. Swift remains a leading processed meat brand today. You may have plenty of business ideas in your head, but in order to start, you just need a good one. Choose one business idea that you know something about. That was how Mrs. Sneed started with the tomato juice business. It was at the time of the depression. The Sneed family was struggling to survive in Evanston, Illinois. Mr. Sneed just lost his job. The two sons needed to go to college. One day, a friend sent them a box of freshly picked tomatoes. Mrs. Sneed decided to make tomato juice from them. She went out to the neighbors to share some bottles. Mrs. Sneed's tomato juice tasted really good. The neighbors liked it very much. Mrs. Sneed thought she could produce more. She shared her idea to her husband and two sons. The Sneeds called their product Morning Glory Tomato Juice. Morning Glory was a bit more expensive than the tomato juice sold in the grocery. But the people don't mind. It was homemade and delicious. Morning Glory is squeezed from quality fresh tomatoes. Soon, the Sneeds had to rent a plant along the railroad. They had to produce more tomato juice for their increasing number of customers. They supplied for hotels and railroad companies. Morning Glory expanded to other food products as well. All these came from Mrs. Sneed's idea in her kitchen. Why start with a $1,000? It is a reasonable amount, which will give you focus and motivation. Most people fail because they lack a target in business. Setting up the amount will give you a clear objective as you start. Otto Schneering was very determined to start his own business. He was only 21 years old. He bought a candy making machine for $100. Otto saw that many succeed in the candy business. He made his first batch of candies. However, they did not sell. Otto made the common mistake that businessmen make. 
If you create the product that you like, it would not sell. But if you create the product that the market likes, then you will make money. Otto created candies which tasted perfect for him. But he didn't think of the demand from the customers. Fortunately, Otto figured this out quickly. There are just three kinds of best-selling candies. People can't get enough of them. They are candies with chocolate, peanut, and caramel. It took three years for Otto to come up with the perfect recipe of candy bar. He combined the three best sellers in one. That is the story of Baby Ruth. It has chocolate, peanuts, and caramel for only five cents per bar. Otto Schneering chose the name Baby Ruth because it's easy to remember and pronounce. He got his $1,000 and more. Mrs. McDougall was a widow living in New York City. She has three young children to raise all by herself. She turned to the only work she knows outside of her household duties. Mrs. McDougall took over her husband's coffee blending business. She only had a small capital. Other coffee businessmen predicted that she'll only last for six months. But Mrs. McDougall proved them all wrong. She mapped around 75 miles around New York and personally marketed her, her business. She supplied for hospitals, clubs, and sanatoriums. Within only two years, Mrs. McDougall has earned $20,000. With her good reputation, Mrs. McDougall was able to open her own coffee shop located at the Grand Central Terminal. She added some snacks to her menu. In the following years, Mrs. McDougall opened six other coffee shops in the city. The depression hit when Mrs. McDougall was 65 years old, but she did not lose hope. Mrs. McDougall got back up and opened three new restaurants. Other women may have been discouraged by the challenges she had faced, but not Mrs. McDougall. She's got a lot of guts and will to succeed. Selling as a business. There are many advantages in becoming a sales agent. Your only capital is the trust and goodwill of the customers. If you are a salesperson, you do not have to wait for a raise. You can create more income as you like. You also don't need to spend hours in the office. Selling could be real fun. You have the opportunity to meet lots of new people. You can connect with the most successful and most influential ones. You work with independence and security. As long as you have good relationship with the customers, you will make money. Sales agents educate and lead people to action. You may not have bought a house, a washing machine, or a vacuum cleaner without an agent to persuade you. Most of all, sales agent brings satisfaction and happiness to the lives of many people. Lucille Anthony is a single parent. Her husband left her. It's up to her to raise their six-month-old baby. She decided to sell silk stockings. Lucille was hired by a manufacturer to sell stockings from house to house. She was given a sample of six different colors. She started to visit her friends. Lucille loved wearing silk stockings. She had so much fun talking about them. But eventually, she sold to every woman she knows. She had to sell to strangers. Lucille became disappointed. She was rejected on every house she had visited. The women at the door would say, not today. I'm busy. I have no money or come back next week. Lucille would reply, I understand you're very busy, Mrs. Smith. I really won't take up any time at all. Won't you let me in? Lucille did not give up until she was let into the house. She starts the real selling as soon as she's invited in. She would take out the samples and show how great her product is. Most of the time, the housewives are infected by Lucille's enthusiasm with the silk stockings. There was one time when she called two sorority houses in University of Chicago. It was just before the commencement exercises. She got orders for 56 pairs just by doing two group demos. Lucille got plenty of commission from the silk stocking company. 
Lucille would not take no for an answer. She is very determined to sell. She has a product which she knows about and she can persuade people. Lucille did not give up even if she had plenty of rejections. George Conrad is not a quitter as well. He is a sales agent for slicing machines. He goes to groceries, restaurants and meat stores to sell his product. George enters and shows a colorful image of the slicing machine to the owner. What do you think of that? He asks. It looks good, the butcher replies. But I can't afford an expensive slicing machine such as that. George would go out to get the sample machine in his car. He would set it up on the counter. This machine is a low price slicer, but it looks and works just like the expensive ones. How much could you afford to pay in cash for a slicer? The owner would reply, the way business is, I couldn't go over $10. George lets the resistance build up. Then he will reveal the real price of the slicing machine. Well, if you can pay that much, get out your money. This slicer will cost you only $7.50. The store owners are often surprised. That is how George gets to sell an average of 40 slicing machines a week. He gives a good demonstration of his product. He shows that it has many benefits for just a low price. Demonstrations and samples are the asset of any sales agent. Dwight Ritchie made lots of money from his mending fluid demos. No, I don't want anything, the people would say to him when they opened the door. But Dwight would reply, that's all right. I just want to show you how to repair some fabrics. When you get a run in a silk stocking, just touch a little mending fluid. You can make repairs much quicker and better. Dwight always carries sample fabrics, which he repaired with his product. After his demo, he'll hand the mending fluid out. Now, you'll want two or three tubes, Dwight would say. The price is 25 cents. He does his door-to-door -door selling from early morning to late afternoon. Dwight proves that if you want to make money, you have to go out there and work hard. If you ask Frank Dupree's how to earn $1,000, he will quickly answer cell fire extinguishers. Frank earned his first $1,000 in six weeks. It wasn't that easy, though. He did sales calls, but he rarely got orders on his first months. Frank soon realized that he was selling to the wrong people. Most of the time, he called people who've got no use for a fire extinguisher. So Frank took out the phone directory and studied it carefully. He listed the firms which he thought would need his product. He got 27 firms located in one business district. Frank planned his route so he would not waste time and energy on his marketing. He came to sell 12 fire extinguishers daily. Frank secured 10 units for one small factory. He decided to focus his market on warehouses, factories, and garages. His commissions amounted to $300 a week. Making things to sell. There was once a village in Germany which became known for excellent wood carving. The people were expert in making religious statues. Their products are known to be very artistic and high quality. If there were only two genius carver in that village, it would be easy to dismiss that they have natural talents. But almost every person in that village knows how to carve. It just proves that a skill can be learned. If you want to be good at anything, you have to practice hard. Genius is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. People often envy those who are famous writers, musicians, or athletes. These geniuses seem to be born with it. But what people do not realize is the hours and hours of practice spent to acquire that level of skill. Think of your favorite authors. They got to where they are because they love to write. They've spent so much time writing that these authors have perfected their style. Because of practice, they were able to produce best-selling books. Every expert carver is once a beginner. A writer cannot be prominent only at first try. 
If you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to start somewhere. Do not be discouraged from failures. You will succeed if you remain on your track and keep going. What is it that you like to do? It is possible that you can make a business out of it. Maybe you picked up a career out of necessity. But if you have that hobby that you really love, you may someday find an opportunity to make money out of it. What is your community like? Are there plenty of children? Do people live in apartments? Do you live in a fishing village or a crowded city? You may find a product or service that will surely sell to your community. If you have something to sell, tell everyone. You must go out to the world to sell your product. That was what Billy B. Van did. He was a comedian who became a successful entrepreneur. Billy was a theater comedian. That was until he had to stop because of tuberculosis. Billy had no money when he got sick. His fellow comedians and friends financed his recovery. For two years, he lived in a pine forest in New Hampshire. That was where he got his business idea. Billy loved the smell of pine trees. He had the idea that there are people who have no time or money to go to the pine forest and smell the freshness of pine trees. Billy thought of selling pine tree soap. He found a soap maker to create the product for him. But Billy has to go out there and do the selling. The comedian laughed at himself. He was never a salesman, but he soon realized that selling is what he has been doing all along. Billy is selling his jokes and acts to the audience every night. He filled his pockets with soap and went out to sell. But there are challenges. There always are. Drug stores refuse to stock his soap and he has no money for advertising. So Billy thought of another way. He spent a lot of time in hotels doing shows. Billy knows many hotel managers from across the country. He found one hotel which permitted him to place a trial order. Billy wrapped his soaps nicely and placed a sticker which said, this soap will keep everything clean but your conscience. The next day, he received a note from a guest. It read, Dear Billy, I like your soap. Send me six cakes. Here's your dollar. Billy started making money. More orders came from other guests. Having a sickness or losing a job is not a hindrance to success. Billy made a successful shift in his career. A comedian can be an entrepreneur. So does a housewife and a widow. Mrs. Smith is a widow from Brooklyn. She loves to bake. As she was making bread one morning, Mrs. Smith thought of starting her food specialty business. She came to coffee shops and tea rooms to sell her products. She got arrangements for her nut breads, coffee cake and donuts. One tea room orders pies and rolls from her every day. One afternoon, Mrs. Smith sent her son out to a tourist camp. The boy rode his bicycle with a basket full of cookies, donuts, pies, and coffee cake. Johnny sold them all without difficulty. He came back home with more orders. Mrs. Smith and Johnny delivered for the tourist camp the whole summer. When fall and winter came, Mrs. Smith found another opportunity. She thought of catering her baked goods since it was party season. She got dozens of orders for a Halloween party. The organizers knew that Mrs. Smith bakes the best donuts in town, so they called her. The secret of Mrs. Smith's success is that her products taste so good that people always comes back for more. Her baked goods became in demand for parties, holidays, and Sunday night dinners in her community. She is doing something she loves and makes good money at the same time. The pressed chicken is Mrs. Knapp's famous recipe. Her family owns a poultry farm in Michigan. Spent hens are too hard for eating. After the breeding season, Mrs. Knapp would gather the old chickens. She used her pressure cooker to prepare the meat in just 40 minutes. Aside from shorter cooking time, the pressure cooker also lets the meat to have more flavor. Mrs. Knapp cuts the chicken into cross sections. She adds seasoning and pours chicken stock. 
For special orders, Mrs. Knapp puts olives, sliced vegetables, and hard-boiled eggs. The old saying goes, if life gives you lemons, you should make some lemonade. For Mrs. Knapp, if you have hundreds of spent hens, you should make tasty pressed chicken. Raising things to sell. What if you have the opportunity for business in a farm or fishery? Does your province have a fruit or vegetable product? Maybe you like planting herbs or flowers? You can make lots of money from raising things you can sell. Take, for example, the stories of Howard and Bill. Howard Whiteley used to work for a map printing company. He had a good compensation and had some savings in the bank. That was until the doctor told him of his health condition. Howard was advised to give up his job. The doctor said he needed to go out more and get as much sunshine as possible. Howard decided to use his savings and buy a 15-acre farm in Indianapolis. The previous owner planted vegetables with it, but Howard set his mind on raising chickens. He does not know the first thing about running a poultry farm. So he read from the bulletins issued by the Department of Agriculture. Howard also visited a poultry farm nearby. He saw that the farmer does not take care of the chickens properly. They are not fed well and their surroundings are not cleaned. Moreover, the farmer does not know how to market his chickens. The farmer growled as if you can learn to raise chickens from a book or a magazine. To him, Reading from poultry magazines and government bulletins are just a waste of time. But Howard Whiteley knows better. Because of his visit, Howard learned what not to do with his own farm. Howard read that the poultry farm must always be clean to avoid the chickens from getting sick. He bought a second-hand brooder and incubator. Then he bought his first 10 dozen eggs. Howard set half of the chicks for breeding. He raised the other half for the market. He continued to read the government bulletins. Howard found that he actually enjoys raising poultry. He gave a lot of thought on how to market his product. He was able to secure orders from three restaurants and two hotels. The customers were satisfied from Howard's plump and milk-fed chickens. He had no troubles in getting repeat orders. His wife helps him to package the chicken meat. They wrap each one carefully to maintain its freshness. Howard's product is more expensive than those sold in the stores, but his clients don't mind. They know that they are paying more for superior quality. Howard gets regular order from restaurants, hotels, and country clubs. Like Howard, Bill Kleiber also started his business by reading books. Bill has a regular job in a paint factory but he has an interesting hobby which is breeding tropical fishes. Bill read any book he could find about fish breeding. He even buys rare expensive books just to learn more. He put into practice what he learns and adds more varieties to his collection. Amazingly, Bill found a market for his beautiful fishes. He started his own business, which is Kay's Aquarium. Of all his fishes, the bettas or fighting fish sell the most. They are colorful fishes with long fins and tails. What's incredible with these fishes is that they are used for gambling. Fighting fishes have to be put in separate tanks because the males fight each other to death. They would constantly attack each other if put in the same tank. However, they are very protective when it comes to their mates and eggs. Bill found a lot of books about fighting fishes. More importantly, he found a lot of customers. Bill lives in San Francisco, but people from Texas, the Midwest, and even Canada order bettas from him through mail. It came to the point when his profit exceeded his salary. George Jessup of Iowa also turned his sideline into a booming business. He makes sums of money by raising bees. George was able to cover all his household expenses with the help of his honey-making friends. He started with just one bee colony. George provided a large hive for them, so they have ample room to breed. He also got large honeycombs for the queen bee, so she'll be more efficient. 
George spent $20 for the bees and equipment. $5 was for processing the honey. The bee colony produced 100 pounds of honey yearly. George packaged his product in five pound containers. More bees were bred in the winter, so George divided the colony and got a second hive. This new colony also produces 100 pounds of honey. Eventually, George got himself 10 bee colonies. He sold to wholesalers and retailers alike. One five pound container is 45 cents each. Although he has 10 colonies, bees don't actually require much attention at all. You can leave the colonies for days. The bees will just feed themselves and keep on working. According to George, bees can be kept in any place with an outside window. You can have the hives in your attic, barn, garage, or cellar. Make sure you have a good queen and the colony will keep on making honey and money for you. Mushrooms are easy to raise as well. Laz Lewin made quick profit from growing them. He bought some mushroom spawn and kept them in the cellar. He had a mushroom bed sized at 100 feet. When he bought the spawns, they just looked like tangled white threads. Laz planted them carefully on the 10x10 mushroom bed. Five weeks later, Laz checked the cellar and saw the baby mushrooms. The incredible thing is that the next morning, they grew 10 times larger. Laz picked the mushrooms and sold them to the market for 45 cents per pound. He earned a total of $110 for his crops. Laz invested more and soon had 1,000 square feet of mushroom bed. He pays no rent, no equipment or marketing expenses. Laz sold his cellar mushrooms to local stores, cafes, and restaurants around town. Starting a roadside business. Perhaps you live near a busy road. You can make money by selling to the passing vehicles and tourists. Common products sold at the roadside are fruits, vegetables, eggs, poultry, hamburgers, hot dogs, barbecues, cold drinks, and souvenirs. Aside from these, you can sell products ideal for the road's location. It might be the case that the road leads to a beach, a baseball stadium, a golf course, a mountain, or a forest. Ella Gaston, a 77 years old woman lived near the Ozark fishing country. A lot of fishermen drive by her house along the highway. Mrs. Gaston was widowed. She is always sick. Mrs. Gaston is in dire need for a source of income. One day, she thought that maybe she could sell fish baits at the roadside. Mrs. Gaston went to a creek and collected the baits herself. She filled her buckets, boxes, pails, and kettles with worms. Her friend helped her in building the roadside stand. She also got a huge sign saying fish baits for sale. Mrs. Gaston's idea worked. The cars stopped at her stand and the fishermen bought her worms. Eventually, she had to hire a few boys to dig for her. Mrs. Gaston priced her worms at 10 cents per dozen. There are days when she sells up to thousand dozens of worms. Mrs. Gaston realized then that she has sold at least one million worms. She was able to pay her debts and support herself. Because of her interesting business, Mrs. Gaston regained her health. What drivers need in any road, though, is spare tires. As he was driving along the road from Chicago to Michigan, James Mowry's front tire blew out. He replaced his flat tire and threw the old one to the weeds. In Michigan, James looked for secondhand tires. He found one for $5 but the tire wasn't that different with the one he just threw away. James thought that this is a great opportunity for business. He decided to start a tire service station which would offer second-hand and low-priced tires. James rented a roadside stand near a gasoline station. He bought 50 rebuilt tires all in good condition. Then, he set up the road signs. Tires $2.00. 25 cents and up 300 feet away, the signs read. In front of his stand, he put up the largest sign, 
home of Jimmy's guaranteed tires, $2.25 and up. In just two days, James had sold all 50 tires. He made the profit of $52. Storekeeping as a business. Surely, there are many kinds of stores in your town or city. Have you noticed some of them closed up or replaced? What are the most successful stores in your street? Which of them sell the most? And what is their secret? People think that stores shut down because of bad location, lack of capital, or poor management. But deeper analysis could reveal that the store did not render a useful or needed service in the community. There are probably lots of food stores, drug stores, hardwares, or furniture stores in your town. Some of them may be part of a big chain. So how do you start your own store? Maybe there are products or services that people have to go to the next town for. You can start from there. Shoe stores require a huge investment. You need a pharmacist if you want to open a drug store. What you can do is to open a specialty store. Simply put, these are stores that specialize in one type of product. Some examples are stores that sell just cookies and biscuits, school supplies, women's accessories, laundry soap, children's toys, nuts and candies, or household items. If you're thinking of starting your own store, you should also consider your hobbies and interests. You should also choose a location which is near your target market. The best-selling shops are those along the sidewalk. Take, for example, the pet stores of Kainowski and Ralph Watkins. Many children passing by were fascinated by their display. Both entrepreneurs did not have a big capital. They invested on good customer service and diligent store maintenance. Kanowski opened up a pet shop in South Chicago. His rented space was too large, though for his small stock of pets, accessories, and cages. So what he did was to make good use of his sidewalk windows. He built a cage made of wooden frames and mesh screens. It only cost him $36. He filled the cage with small, colorful birds. Kanowski put linoleum and bird gravel at the bottom of it. He set up the perches and nests for the birds. The canaries and lovebirds attract people to his store. They would walk by and stop to watch. Some people come in, ask questions, and buy birds on the spot. Kanowski's business became more successful when he added cute puppies to his display. He chose puppies aged three weeks to two months old. Children stand for hours in front of the window to watch them. When they have a dollar, they go in and buy one. These are not pedigreed dogs yet. They sell nicely. Kanowski covered his rent and electricity with his puppy profits. The most important thing in running a pet store is sanitation. Kanowski cleans his shop thoroughly every single day. That is to avoid bad odor, which will repel the customers. Cleanliness also prevents his animals from getting sick. Kanowski adds more to his profit by selling dog food, bird cages, bird gravel, and other pet accessories. Ralph Watkins, meanwhile, owns an aquarium also in South Chicago. He earns thousands of dollars every year. When Watkins started, he only has eight kinds of fish in 10 small tanks. In three years, he was able to acquire 120 varieties of fish living in 130 tanks. Watkins started his business with only $200. He pays a small amount of his rent. He bought fishes with the $100. The other $100, he invested on tanks, water plants, and accessories. Watkins opened his store on the first day without a single cent on his pocket. On that early morning, children passed by his store on their way to school. They asked about the gold fishes and went on their way. In the afternoon, they came back with more of their friends. Watkins welcomed them into the store. A little girl wanted to buy a gold fish. She asked Watkins, what will I call it? He answered, what's your name? Sonia, 
the little girl said. Then this goldfish should be named Sonia. That sold it for Watkins. The other children bought their own fishes and named their new pets after them or their friends. Watkins started earning money. The kids came back to his store to buy more fishes and had fun giving them their names. They would say, Alice has a tummy ache or Henry died, to which the parents will laugh about. Watkins takes the opportunity to teach the kids and the parents how to take care of the fishes. Watkins got more income from valuable clients who buy rare tropical fishes. He helps them set up their own aquarium in the living room. He also expanded business by growing his own water plants. Tropical fishes need tropical plants to live. Amazingly, all these plant varieties can be found in Florida. Watkins sells many kinds of fishes from guppies to tetras to gurami, cichlids, angelfish, and more. These pets are cheap and easy to maintain. Most of all, they bring in lots of profit. Nothing beats quality in making a business grow. People would go to your store if they know that you offer the best product in town. That's what happened with Ted Landsman and his hamburger business. Ted is a young man from California. He was driving his old beat-up truck to a friend because he can't afford to run it anymore. On his way from Los Angeles to Pasadena, he passed by a hamburger stand. The owner had given up on his unprofitable business. He was just about to close the shack when Ted came. They greeted each other. The owner then offered to exchange his hamburger stand for Ted's old beat-up truck. And just like that, Ted found himself a new business venture. He only has 11 cents in his pocket. On the shack, he found two dozen buns and three cases of soft drinks. Ted knows that his 11 cents wouldn't go very far. So he borrowed $50 from his friend. Ted began to think about hamburgers. Most of the stands in his town sell burgers at 10 cents each. Some do so at only half the price. But Ted went out for quality. He chose the best buns and best ground beef for his business. He priced his hamburgers at 15 cents each. For six months, Ted's burger shack just broke even. His business boomed when one customer requested for a slice of cheese. From then on, Ted dedicated himself on making the best cheeseburgers. Ted's cheeseburgers were so good that he was able to open two more shacks in Los Angeles. Then, he opened a steak restaurant. As with his best tasting cheeseburgers, he offered the highest quality steaks. In 10 years, Ted's business grew five times over. Promoting a small business. The main ingredient of a business success is goodwill with the customers. But every once in a while, promotions and advertisements are needed to bring in more income. People love showmanship. If you find the right promos and ads for your business, people will flock in to buy your products. John Harding opened his own restaurant in Chicago, but it didn't sell at first because there are a lot of other restaurants in town. People tell him that he's foolish for starting another restaurant. They thought that Harding will run it for a while and just break even. But he proved them all wrong. Harding got an idea which won the appetites of the general public. His business grew and he opened six more restaurants. Of course, Harding knows that he must offer good food. What made his restaurant sell more is his effective advertising. He bought a small advertisement in the local newspaper. Harding thought of a humorous copy and a cartoon illustration to come with it. He also set up his window display to match with the newspaper ad. Harding's first advertisement featured corned beef and cabbage. He became known as the Corned Beef King. He printed more pictures of his mouth watering dishes and meals which matched the season. One of his winning ads was Ham Happiness. Harding got an illustration of a laughing pig sitting in a glass of champagne. The copy read, Ham Happiness. At Harding's, they don't simply slice off a piece of ham and place it between two slices of bread. Oh no! 
The carver dips the slices of perfectly baked sugar-cured ham into champagne sauce before making up the sandwich. The price is still 15 cents. Harding's restaurants are always crowded because of his ads in the morning papers. It costs him $75 every day, but Harding doesn't mind. More and more people come in to indulge in his delectable meals. Like Harding, Howard Stevens of Detroit, Michigan also invested on advertising. He rented a vacant house along the highway and turned it into an inn. Many cars travel that highway, but still, the inn would not sell. Howard realized that to attract people, and he needs more than a few chairs, tables, and cases of beer. He thought of some gimmicks. First, Howard improved the furnishings of his place. He had some carpenters to set up the dance floor. He also found some cheap but modern looking tables. A semicircular bar was placed with long paneled mirrors hanging behind. Howard also invested on fryers, roasters, and grills, which let him serve nine chickens or four pork loins at a time. Finally, Howard put up colorful signs along the highway. He set the 17 painted signs equally apart. Each of them features a different kind of Howard's tasty grilled meat sandwich. The price is written on each sign, which is only 15 cents. It also tells the distance from that point to Howard's Inn. At opening night, Howard became very surprised. Customers kept coming from 6 to 9 in the evening. Around 119 cars stopped at his inn. Howard and his wife served them well, but by 9.30, they were already out of stock. The couple spent the next day filling out their supply. They roasted chickens, beef cuts, and pork loins. By night, the inn was crowded once again. Many people stayed to enjoy the dance floor. Howard saw the traveler's need for a place to eat and rest in the country. He offered delicious but cheap food. On average, each person spends 40 cents for a good meal. Howard made so much profit by setting up the dance floor and the highway signs. His inn not only offered good food, but also good times as well. Selling things by mail. If you want to start a mail order business, you should remember three important concepts. They are target clients, mailing lists, and sales letters. The same principles apply in selling things online. Successful entrepreneurs use direct mail in the past. Today, you can have the convenience of emails. So you have a business idea. Your product must be very specific so that you can figure your target clients. They are the people who would always buy from you. Your product may be leather handbags or personalized wallets. You must figure out where your target clients are and how you could reach them. From your target clients, you build your mailing list. There you list the names, contact numbers, or emails of your clientele. You can acquire this information from your personal connections, business website, or pay-per-click ads. You should take good care of your mailing list. It is where you'll generate your income. You must always update your mailing lists with your new products or promos. You can send your target clients some valuable information and tips which they can use. Most of all, you must answer questions and keep in touch with your clients. If you have more people in your mailing list, it is likely that you'll generate more income. Finally, you should learn how to write an effective sales letter. Technology has changed a lot, but mail order businesses still benefit a lot from good copywriting. How do you make sales letters that sell? You do not have to be a professional writer. There are techniques you can follow to write your own sales letter. You can learn from these stories of two successful entrepreneurs. Henry Field used to travel on his horse cart to sell crop seeds. He is from southwestern Iowa. His business is to sell the seeds from farm to farm in small villages. Henry has his own garden where he plants, raises, and prepares those seeds. It was a one-man business. 
Henry travels as far as he can. That part of Iowa has no surface roads yet at the time. Sometimes, Henry has to cross the fields just to reach the farmer's house. He didn't stop, even if it's too hot or cold outside. He keeps on going even if the roads are full of dust or mud. Henry became friends with the farmers. He gives helpful suggestions on their farming. He gives news about the good seeds and good crops to plant. The farmers got to know and like Henry. They always look forward to his visits. Before long, the demand for seeds became too much for Henry to handle. He decided to shift to mail order business. In that way, he can focus on the production and delivery of the seeds. Henry bought a secondhand printing machine and started writing sales letters. Henry already got his mailing list of customers. More importantly, he knows how to appeal to them. He writes to the farmers in the way that he talked to them in person. He used ordinary day-to-day -day language. Henry made sure his letters are brief and direct to the point. He says, when you're driving along on a freezing day and met a farmer taking a load of corn to the market, you can't make him stop and shiver. You have to tell him your business at once, get his order and let the farmer go on. It's the same way when you write him a letter or send a catalog. Even though brief, Henry's sales letters didn't lack the stories and friendliness that he shared with the farmers. He doesn't write in a bookish way. Henry is always genuine and personal in his writing. The farmers took Henry's mail order business very well. They responded to his sales letters and sent their orders regularly. Soon, Henry got mail orders from Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska. Henry has never met these farmers before, but they trusted him anyway. Year after year, his mailing list grew. But Henry still writes in the same informal, personal, and friendly manner. His sales increased from a few hundred dollars to three million dollars annually. Soon, Henry Field Company expanded to offer general merchandise. Henry began to sell other goods such as hats, shoes, overalls, and even tires. He improved his mail order business further. He sells apples, oranges, corn and potatoes by the bushels, because that's the way farmers buy them. Henry also sold coffee in 5, 10, or 25 pound containers. For canned goods, he sold them by the dozen. Henry used to own a horse cart and a small garden. After years of hard work, he has acquired acres of fields and built his own company. All these success is due to his effective sales letters. If you want to succeed in the mail order business, you should write to your customers like they're your longtime friends. Tell good stories and tips which they can learn from. Build a good relationship, but never forget to ask for the order. In the last few paragraphs of your sales letter, be sure to tell the customers what to do. Do they need to sign the order form? Do they need to send back the reply card? Your customers would not know unless you tell them simply what to do. Remember to write with value and write with purpose. How do you make sure that your sales letters are going to be read? It boils down to figuring out your target clients. If you mail out to the right people, they will definitely be interested in your letter and reply with an order. For example, J.W. Robertson Son is a mail-order business which offers fine Havana cigars. They have been doing so for more than 30 years. The secret is sending to the right kind of people. Roberts only accepts deposits on their open account, strictly no cash and no COD. Some of their target clients have been on the mailing list for 20 years. Selling your services. If you want to get started in the service business, you have to first ask yourself, what is it that you like to do? What do you do best? Do you have a certain skill or specialty? It is necessary for you to be a specialist. In other words, you have to narrow your field. You need to find out your specific niche. In that way, you can improve your skill and master it. 
You can also eliminate competition. It applies not only in the service business, but to other careers as well. To be a successful doctor, you need to specialize on something. If people know that you're an expert, they will naturally come to you. Customers are willing to pay a higher price for an expert advice or service. If you're the only neurologist in town, then you will make more income. Figure out your niche and be good at it. More importantly, always give good value to your customers. If you offer quality service, people will be willing to pay more. You can ask for a higher price on your premium offers. Here are stories of entrepreneurs which you can learn a lot from. Have you heard of the service called rug washing? Edward Anderson made his first $1,000 by washing people's rugs or carpets. Edward lost his job as a department store manager. That's why he got started on this unique business. A carpet washing machine was used in the department store that he worked for. Edward called the manufacturer and arranged an easy installment plan. He went out to ask neighbors if they want to avail of his service. He offered 1.50 cents per rug. One morning, Edward was able to clean seven rugs. He did so quickly without removing the rugs from the living room. He got lucky on his first orders. But by afternoon, the housewives that Edward talked to rejected him. He went home and listed the numbers of hotels, apartments, and offices in town. Edward called and he was able to secure $30 worth of service. That wasn't enough though, because his due date for the machine was getting near. Edward thought that if the managers don't want their rugs clean that day, maybe they may want to the next week. So he called again and got more orders. He earned $93 in one hotel and $107 in an office building. Eventually, Edward was able to pay for the machine and earn his profit. There was once a dressmaker in Chicago who overheard a stout woman complaining to a shopkeeper. The stout woman was upset that she couldn't find clothes to fit her. The dressmaker approached the woman politely and introduced herself. The stout woman came to visit the dressmaker in her shop. It turns out she has a sister and a few friends who also have the same body type. They all became the dressmaker's customers. She took the sizes of her first customers. Aside from dresses, she also offered to make their lingerie. The dressmaker suggested that the women plan their clothes for the season. She began to look on magazines and department stores to get more inspiration. The dressmaker bought sample fabrics for her customers to see. She had a brochure of the latest styles and trends. Her customers trusted her judgment and good taste. She got many recommendations from them. Later on, the dressmaker found another market for her expertise. Tall women also find it difficult to buy clothes from the stores. She offered them alterations for longer skirts and longer sleeves. The stores can't provide for women with unique body types. The dressmaker made lots of profit from her specialty. There was also one woman in Florida who's got a unique specialty. She catches shrimps and sells them for fishermen to use as bait. Her name is Sadie Miller. Sadie went broke when the real estate bubble burst. She looked for ways to get back up. That's how she got into the business of shrimping. At first, Sadie hired a guy to run her shrimp dock, but he took a vacation and never came back. Sadie committed herself to do the challenging task. Sadie would wear rubber boots and overalls along with her helpers to catch the elusive shrimps. These creatures move their habitat every day, so they have to be hunted. It doesn't matter if the shrimps are large or small. They just need to be caught alive. Sadie makes more money in the winter because the shrimps are harder to find. She set her shrimps for $1 per 100 pieces. She hired more helpers for the busy season. Like Sadie, James Bradley also got back up from financial crisis. James is from a small town in Wisconsin. His company went bankrupt and he lost his job. James did a few jobs in the neighborhood, but none of them was permanent. 
One day, James was walking around the house thinking of what he'll do next. He glanced upon his garage and saw the chassis of his old truck. Perhaps, if he could fix the engine, he could do some trucking jobs. James went to the junkyard for the truck's body. He fixed his truck and painted it. James and his wife kept their eyes and ears open for any opportunity. James' first job was for a neighbor who's moving to Milwaukee. Large trucking companies won't bother for moving household items and other odd jobs. But James Bradley gladly took them all. Eventually, he was able to buy other trucks and handled all trucking jobs to Milwaukee. He also got hauling contracts for several companies. Like James Bradley, John Bancroft was also unemployed. He was a college athlete, but John found it difficult to get a job he wanted. So he started the Springfield Boys Club. John offered the service of teaching and coaching boys at sports. He divided the club into two. One is for boys eight years and younger. The other group is for boys nine to 14 years old. John would meet them on alternate days after school. The charge for each boy is $5 monthly. There are 25 boys for each group. John makes over $1,000 yearly. From this amount, he pays for his assistant and their rental of a hotel swimming pool. John prepares the boys' activities all year round. According to the season, he trains the boys in baseball, football, boxing, gymnastics, swimming, hiking, and rowing. On rainy days, John would teach them how to make kites, wagons, and toy airplanes. Sometimes, he holds swimming events or boxing contests so the parents can attend. One of the oddest jobs may be taking care of lots in the cemetery. One day, Arthur Ruggles was driving from Kansas to a nearby town. He passed by a rundown cemetery. He saw this as an opportunity for business. Arthur talked to the owner, and the man admitted that the cemetery needed more attention. He needs someone to clean the driveways, remove the tall grasses, plant some seeds, and level the soil. The cemetery attendant cannot handle it all. However, the owner told Arthur that he cannot afford to pay for the services. But Arthur was not discouraged easily. He said that he can accept cemetery lots as payment. The owner agreed immediately and closed the deal. Arthur is going to be paid $2,000 worth of cemetery lots in exchange for his services. He started to work and hired two gardeners to help him. His smarter move was to hire a salesman to market the cemetery lots for him. Before the work is done, the salesman has already sold the lots. Arthur gave him the commission of $500. He also paid for the gardeners and the expenses for materials. All in all, Arthur made $1,000 profit from the deal. The amazing thing is he got the same deal in other cemeteries out of town. Arthur Ruggles began to earn several thousand dollars yearly. Paying for a college education Many famous personalities attribute their success to their early working experiences. College part-time jobs are a great way to learn how to value money and deal with different kinds of people. Most importantly, these jobs help build one's character, which is an advantage that sons or daughters of wealthy individuals may be missing out on. There are typical jobs such as store clerks, library assistants, tutors, waiters, or fast food crew members. However, there are also unusual jobs that offer better experiences and sometimes better rewards. One Sunday afternoon, Mr. Huntley was washing his car when a young man approached him and said, I believe that car would look better if it were Simonized. Huntley replied, it certainly would, but it costs $5 and I don't feel like spending that much right now. The young man then handed him a small card with the word Simonizing written in the center. The boy's name, address, and contact number were written on the lower left-hand corner. I will Simonize your car for only $3, and I will do a really good job, he said. 
Mr. Huntley learned that the young man had just finished polishing the neighbor's car and that he was a student at Washington University. The boy polished cars every weekend. Would next Saturday morning be okay to work on your car? The young man asked. Impressed by the student's politeness, Mr. Huntley agreed and became curious about the diligent young man. Do you have many jobs like this? Mr. Huntley inquired. Yes, I do, the young man replied. The student cleans and polishes at least one car a day. He is already a junior and has been earning his tuition fees ever since. He has regular customers and receives recommendations from them because he does such a good job, the student proudly said. Mr. Huntley learned that the young man built his clientele by approaching people who were washing their cars. I had these cards printed, went along the alleys, and wherever I found a man cleaning up his car, I would present my card and offer to do a good job on his car. I also went around to offices and factories. Whenever I saw a man getting into a car that looked like it needed polishing, I would step up and give him one of my cards, the student explained. Well, I'll have to get back to my job down the alley. I'll leave a couple of my cards. If you have any friends who want their cars cleaned and polished, I'd appreciate it if you would let them know about me. I'll be around early Saturday morning to do your car. Thank you for the job, sir. That evening, Mr. Huntley told his wife about the student. How could you turn down a polite, ambitious boy like that? especially one with so much initiative. There was once a talented girl in Missouri who had a unique skill, wood carving. She spent a lot of time practicing it on her dad's workbench. One day, she experimented with tiny pieces of wood and carved a figure of a cute puppy. She attached it to a pin and wore it to school the next day. Her sorority friends saw it and asked her to make more for them. Before she knew it, Everyone in the sorority wanted those cute puppies on their hats and scarves. The girl began making more pins and charged a small price for them. The puppy pins became a fad in her school and soon nearby shops wanted her to supply the pins. The girl had the help of her sister, brother, and dad to produce the wooden puppies. Previously unable to pay for her tuition fees, the girl now had more money to spare. Conclusion What happens next when you've earned your first $1,000? Be wise in using your money. You can invest on stocks or bonds. But as the saying goes, do not put all your eggs in one basket. When most people buy, sell your stocks. When most people sell, that's the time for you to buy. You've learned how to start your own business. The best time to do so is now. As you learned from the stories, successful entrepreneurs just have a lot of guts. It doesn't matter if you're young, if you're widowed, if you're divorced, or if you're unemployed. You can start your business and earn money. What matters is you get yourself up and work. You've learned about selling as a business. The common image of a salesperson is one who loves to talk and go to parties. But even if you're not like that, you can be successful. You just have to be persistent and full of purpose. You've learned about making things to sell. Practice makes perfect. Any skill can be learned. If you spend so much time practicing that skill, then you will become an expert. Remember that every expert you know was once a beginner. You've learned about raising things to sell. Farming, breeding, or planting may seem like a lot of work, but you may find that you enjoy the process. There are many opportunities for income by raising chickens or breeding fish. You've learned about starting a roadside business. The secret is to have the product that the travelers need. You also got to have visible road signs. You've learned about storekeeping as a business. There are probably a lot of stores in your town or city. Some of them are huge chains, but do not be discouraged. There's always a room for a better product or a better service. 
you've learned about promoting a small business. Good relationship with the customers must be your priority as an entrepreneur. But every now and then, you need some promos and ads to expand your business. You have to think of the best ways to attract your kind of customers. You've learned about selling things by mail. In the mail order business, you need to figure out your target clients first. You can build your mailing list by giving more value. The best sales letters are those which are friendly and personal. Tell your readers good stories, but do not forget to ask for the order. You've learned about selling your services. To be successful in the service business, you need to be a specialist. If you have a specific niche, you can master your skill and eliminate competition. Always give more value to your customers. If you do so, people will be willing to pay for a higher price. You've learned about paying for a college education. You can definitely pay your way to college by starting your own business. Like any entrepreneur, you just need that guts in you. Being a working student helps a lot in building character. Have you got a business idea? You now know that there are almost an infinite number of ways to earn good money. You just need to go out there and work hard. There is no shortcut to success. You know that successful entrepreneurs would not reach that far if they had quit on the challenges they faced. As the old saying goes, winners never quit and quitters never win.